What is up everybody? Welcome back to another Quick Tips video. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking all about string writing. So um, because this is a Quick Tips video, I'm gonna to try to keep it um, as, at a reasonable length. I don't wanna go way, way too deep here, but um, I wanted to cover all the essential bases and then kind of go through a few examples to kind of show you what I'm talking about. And I'll try to go through a couple of styles as well. All right, so let's get started. So first of all, let's quickly talk about the string family itself. It comes with a set of violins, violas, celli, and double basses. So the violins are the highest string instruments and they can go very, very high into the into their ranges. Uh, the violas are kind of like the middleman, you know, they, uh, they bridge the gap between the violins and the celli. Um, the celli are kind of like the strong muscular guys who, who are like the jocks of the family, you know, they, they pride themselves on their low end and their, um, their, their beauty, uh, but they, they really also excel into the high registers. The double basses are kind of like the, the bodyguards, you know, they, they, um, they're pretty much immovable. They're super strong, you know, and they, they do, um, they, they really lend a supporting role to the entire thing, which is great. Um, it's the bread and butter section of the modern orchestra, in my opinion, the string family, uh, you know, you have the brass section, you have the woodwinds, and you have the percussion, but in most film scores, the first string family, or sorry, the first uh, section, orchestral section you'll hear is the string family, just because it's so versatile and um, it can lend itself to the, uh, to the, to textural uh, writing very, very well. Um, like I said here in the third point, um, it can be you know, anything from beautiful to aggressive to scary, you know, depending on the articulations you use, um, you know, the, the ways you can express music on, on strings is just amazing. Um, and I just noted that they have a very wide playable and dynamic range. So playable as in like very, very low notes uh, and very, very high notes, as well as um, they can go from the softest whisper, uh, whispery uh, dynamics to like fortissimo, you know, ranges. So... Uh, yeah, really great stuff. So when it comes to composing for strings, um, the first point I said, the piano and the voice are your most accurate guides. Now, the reason I said this is because for the piano, because it's an instrument where you can play chords and melodies, um, anytime you're basically thinking of writing for strings and you're thinking of, you know, using different sections at the same time, using harmonies and melodies and all that, if it sounds good on the piano, then it will very, very likely sound great when translating them over to the strings. Just the way the instruments are, are you know, uh, created. And um, yeah, the, the piano is, is, you know, basically the ultimate instrument to tell us if something is going to translate well into an orchestral setting. And, uh, and, and for the voice, you know, uh, a lot of the time we're trying to make our music very vocal, very melodic, very lyrical, and we're trying to imitate the human voice. So if you can sing, or if you have, if you know someone who can sing well, um, and you want them to sing a line for you, uh, then then use that to your advantage. And you know, if if you think the violins might be able to play a really nice romantic singing line, um, but you're not quite sure how it would sound in real life then you can either ask uh, someone to actually sing that line for you, or you can use a string patch and see if it translates well. Um, second point here, I noted that thirds and sixths sound rich, while fifths and octaves sound open. I mean, this, these are kind of like the basics of, uh, of harmony here, but thirds and sixths provide lots of color. Uh, these are colorful intervals, while fifths and octaves are, are perfect intervals, and those are very open and pure, right? Um, uh, counterpoint can be very effective, especially in strings. Um, very, very lush writing uses a lot of counterpoint to to express emotion and uh, movement. So, uh, final point here is use articulations to your advantage. I mentioned in the previous slide that strings have lots of different articulations, and some uh, I, I consider vibrato kind of like an articulation. I mean, it's a means to express passion and um, emotion, right? Spiccato is kind of like bouncing your bow off the string. So it's like a even more intense staccato. And uh, th those kind of give us this action and aggressive feeling. Um, tremolos are kind of like the, you know, rubbing your string back and forth on the string to create this uh, tension sound, uh, you know, a lot of tension in that. And uh, finally, the flageolets are the harmonics. So you get this very whispery, airy sound, which is great for, uh, 
moments of suspense or even like the opening of a scene when something is starting to fade into view you can use that to kind of introduce um, sonically what's going to happen uh, let's move on to some arranging tips here so you should always be using the dynamic range for as natural of an expression as possible uh, I really think the key to good and idiomatic writing is really using the instruments to their full effect. And because the string instruments have such a wide range, um, it makes sense to use them. Of course, it it is entirely contextual, depending on your piece, but I prefer to um, use the softs whenever possible and then contrast them with the louder dynamics and timbral dynamics whenever possible. Um, second point here is that the strings can play longer lines. They're very nimble. So by longer lines, I just mean that you know, because string players don't actually need to breathe to create sound, um, they, they can afford to play longer lines. Uh, now, this is not to say that you should write lines that go on, you know, for like five minutes without any rest or without any breaks, uh, because for the most part, we're trying to recreate the human voice, as we said, right? So you want to naturally put in breaths uh, where a singer would naturally take breaths if you're trying to imitate a human voice. I also wrote down they're very nimble, so they can play fast runs very quickly. They can do arpeggios, just like on a piano. You can play runs and uh, quick figures very easily with some practice. Divisi is a concept where you can take um, basically one of the sections of the orchestra uh, of the string orchestra and separate them into uh, you know different sections within that one section. So like if we're looking at the violins, ones for example, the first section of violins, and you, you have two notes that you want the violins to play, the violin wants to play, like an A or a D, A and a D, um, you can get half of the violin ones to play the higher D while you get the rest of the violin ones to play the A. So if you apply Divisi for every section, and then you can do this for more than two notes, obviously, then uh, you can you know write very complex chords so there's really no limit to that. Um, but if you if you have more of the instruments playing the same note, then you just add more richness and, and you get a more full sound. So it's kind of a, a balancing act there. And some libraries come with the ability to introduce Divisi, which is really cool. Um, and it, the last point I noted here is that the lower string instruments playing higher notes can create intensity and focus. So if you just imagine like a cello section playing um, a soaring melodic line kind of in the higher uh, register of the viola in the lower section, lower range of the violin. Um, if you've heard, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, romantic string music, you know, this is, happens a lot in order to create a fuller body of sound in the celli, rather than having them, having the violins play lower, which is a thinner sound by nature. So that's just, it's, it's just knowing what the instruments sound like uh, throughout the ranges and um, some libraries you know, express these very, very well. Let's talk about some best practices. So we don't want to overload the low end. And this again goes back to how we play on the piano. Um, if you if you played the piano at all, or if you are familiar with the overtone series, um, the the more notes we put into the lower end, kind of like any anything below the C, below middle C, if you have too many notes there, it starts to cloud up uh, the frequency spectrum quite a bit. And you start to get these overlapping tones that um, don't really sound that pleasing unless you're going for that specific effect. So uh, it's always a better idea if you're going for something full and balanced in the frequency spectrum to have more space. So like octaves and like you know six, sevens, even like fifths in the in the lower registers. And as you go up and up higher, then you lessen the distance between the intervals. Uh, you know, between the different notes. So uh, we can demonstrate that as well in a minute. Uh, allow for breathing room, we talked about already, especially if you're um, kind of imitating how a vocalist would be singing your line. Just uh, make sure you allow for breathing room, like rests and all that. Counterpoint breathes expression, right? So if, uh, if some sections are holding a certain note and then the other sections are also holding the same note and everything moves together, it sounds kind of like a pad and uh, it doesn't really sound that effective. But if you have some sections holding one note and then the other sections move while they're holding, while the other ones are holding, then you get this individuality in the different sections. And then it comes through as like, um, you know, more than one instrument playing a note. So 
Uh, the last thing I wrote here is to avoid hard quantization. As MIDI uh, orchestrators, it's very easy to just press Q and be done with it. Once you record your string lines in, you, if you just press uh, Q in Logic, all the notes will uh, just jam together to the downbeat and uh, they'll just lock in 100% and you won't have any variance which then affects the realism of the entire thing. So if we're thinking about realism, human beings cannot play, uh, for example, um, a difficult rhythm 100% on the beat all the time. So if we're trying to emulate that, we have to make sure we leave some, some uh, you know, mistakes in there in terms of timing. No, not, nothing too drastic, right? So usually I recommend at most 80 to 90% quantization. Um, if some if it starts to sound too robotic, then you know that you're quantizing too hard. So that's just another note to make there. Okay, so without any further ado, I, let's let's just jump into our DAW and uh, take a look at a couple of examples of how I would compose, um, you know, a short passage for strings in different styles. So here you go. All right, so now that we're inside Logic, let's take a look at a uh, a chord progression, and I'm going to try to sketch it out with using all five sections of the strings. Here you can see I'm using Cinematic Studio strings, and I have all the sections loaded. That's five in total: um, uh, violins one, violins two, violas, cello, and basses, and then it also comes with the full ensemble. But I'm using the dedicated patches here. And the chord progression I'm going with is uh, I chose E flat major. I love that key. It's a very nice and lush sound. I'm, I'm going to do the one chord, the five chord over uh, over the third, so first inversion. I'm going to do six, and then I'm going to do a secondary dominant of four, and then the four chord. It probably sounds like a jumbled mess, so let me just play it, and then you can see what I'm talking about here. So first of all, I'm going to do the very fundamentals. I'm just going to I'm going to basically record each track, and you'll see what I mean here. And I'm not really going to do much counterpoint, so just have a listen to this. That violins one is done, that's the melody line I want. And all of those notes fit within the chord progression as well. All right, so now let's do the basis so I can outline the harmonic structure here. This should be relatively straightforward. All right, here we go. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna start from the beginning. Silly me. So you can already tell by just the violins um, one and the basses that I'm going for something more lyrical here, a little bit more emotional. So I'm just going to put this note in. There we go. All right, so now let's move on to the, um, let's do violins two. Okay, so I know that my melody note, the first one is on E flat above middle C. So that's kind of already low, you know, I'm going to try to make the violins to not too much lower than that, maybe a fourth down. Let's go. So just a tiny bit of counterpoint there. I lost my first note again, so let me do that. Put that one in. So I'm, I'm starting on B flat because that's basically the next chord tone down from E flat. And that's a fourth away from E flat. That's not too bad here. Now, if I wanted to make it ve uh, very, um, very strict in terms of all the notes moving together, then I would put this D over here to change with the violins one at the same time, as you can see. So that's violins one, go back to violins two, and you can see if I put it right there, they're going to change together. So it would sound like this. Right. And just to keep it all identical right now, let me just do that. So I'm going to match it up with violin one. And there, and here you can see I have two B flats in the violins one because I wanted this repetition of the B flat in there. Okay, let's continue downwards. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's treat it like a sandwich. So let's go to the celli now. And so I have my 
E flat below middle C. And I also have um, my B flat here in the violins too, which is already pretty close to the uh, to the bass, right? So right now the the bass note, which is the uh, the E flat, and the violins two note, which is a B flat, is only a fifth apart. So now I can I can make some choices. Do I want the celli to be? Uh, do I want it to fill in the third? So that would be the G. And if so, what would I do with the violas? So I would say there's basically, I mean, there's a few options here. Number one is if I put in the G in this in the celli here, I'm just gonna play this for you and see, show you what that sounds like. So I didn't write the module there, but but let me try that again. Right. So already there, it, it fills it in pretty nicely. But then what that does is it leaves out the violas because I'm pretty close in register already. So another thing you can do, depending on the context, if you want this to be a super intimate thing, then yes, it makes sense for the basses to be up a little bit here in this register. But if that wasn't really a problem and I wanted to give everything uh, its own um, space in the frequency spectrum, then I could just take all the basses and lower them down an octave. So now this gives me additional room for the celli to take part and not, everything is not going to be so close in a close position voicing anymore. You know, I have more room for additional voices. So let's see what this sounds like first before we add in the violas and celli. Right. So that definitely works. The basses are, are not too low. They, they're still in a comfortable register there. So now in the celli, I could start on the octave. Let me do that actually. If I start on the octave, I have this E flat above the basses. So I can start on an octave above the basses and then maybe I don't wanna follow the basses exactly. So maybe I'll go up after that. Let's, let's find out, let's try this out and see what works. So we got a unison there going on. Uh, let's have a quick listen. Now I like how this how this G sounds with everything else. It's filling in that third really nicely. Um, this E flat, I might just. I might even just use the G there, extend it there. So not only does it outline the melody, but when the melody changes in the B flat, the celli can stay on that G and then just rise up to A flat to meet the, the next chord, you know? So that still sounds a little bit empty because a lot of these chords, I only have the, the root and the, the fifth, okay? So now, let us add in the violas. This should add in our mixing layer here. And if we're missing anything else, then we can tweak a little bit more after that. So I'm gonna start on a G because of that, it's the missing third of the chord. Okay, so you, you can see the violas are playing a very important role here. Again, I lost the first note. So bring it up to a G. There we go, let's have a listen. Okay, so F is already being played. I can hear that octave with something else. Let's try a B flat to have that, um, to have the fifth in there. Sorry, the root. There we go. Okay, so the B flat was definitely missing, right? So I experimented. I, I heard that the B flat wasn't there. I put that in, and now suddenly the mid range is filled with that nice B flat. Um, if I wanted to be basic, then I, I would basically have this B flat continue all the way to the next chord, and then it would go down to the G there. However, I kind of wanted to have this movement inside the line. So while the overall chord is being played as a five chord, I want to turn it into a dominant seventh so I can add in the seventh below 
which is an A flat, and now this becomes the 5 7 of E flat major. So it sounds like this. And you can see here I have my D flat, or they call it C sharp, but it's D flat. Um, and that is basically the secondary dominant note. So I'm doing the uh, five seven of four. The four chord in E flat major is A flat major. So the dominant seventh of A flat major is E flat seven, which has a D flat in it. So that's why I'm putting the D flat here in the violas. I want it to be a texture that is felt, not necessarily heard as much, but I want the listener to definitely uh, recognize that it's there. You know, it changes the color up just a little bit. So I'm, I'm relatively happy with the way the violas are playing. They're filling in the gaps. Um, you know, the cello and the basses have more of the foundation, the viola, uh, sorry, the violins, um, carry the melody and violins too, are supporting that melody with harmony, but we could do even more. Let's, let's play with violins too for a second here. Let's see what other notes I can put in here. So. So here I have the D to E flat. I don't have to do too much here because it's just going up a half step. So I don't want to make that too busy here. Now here, I'm going from E flat up to the G. So I could introduce some passing notes, for example, you know, along the way. So let's see what that would sound like. Okay. Um, so actually the only passing note I really need is the F there. Right there, you know? So it has this additional step up to the G and um, and I'm subdividing a little bit differently. Uh, I have the, I think this is on the and. Yeah, it's on the and, because it's one and two and three and four. So when you get these transition or passing notes on the off beats, it basically helps to push the momentum forward just a little bit. So now if I look at both violins one and two, you can see that, you know, um, this is violin one, it's coming a little bit early there, but that's okay. The violence two passing note is going on the off beat just before we go to that downbeat. So for me, that is, uh, or sorry, to that's that beat four there. So that's what I wanted. Okay. So now if we look at all three tracks, uh, violence one, violence two, and violas, you can see they're doing different things. Violence one and two are, um, you know, they're they're playing their uh, lines here, and then the the violas have this moment of going down on one of those uh, the weaker beats like beat two. Um, so you can play around with the counterpoint. There's really no rules as long as these sections are interspersed with counterpoint. Um, again, this is you know situational, but I wanted to show you an example where uh, you know we have a pretty basic melody. The basses are doing their chord progression, so they're kind of going actually in in con uh, contrary motion right now. The cello is kind of outlining the the octave above the basses. But I also wanted to throw in the third in there occasionally and also the fifth to leave some open space. Uh, it's very important to not clog up the low end. So that's very important. Think about the harmonic series. And then uh, violins one, violins two, and violas. Um, you know, violins one carries the melody, violins two supports that melody underneath. Uh, they it can have some counterpoint in there as well because if the violins one is holding a longer note, the violins two can do a, 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 you know some things in there, um, you know, have some ascending and descending motion and the violas as well. So in this case, I use the violas to fill in the gaps, um, most most notably the third of the chord. And as soon as I put that in there and um, you know put in any necessary notes that were missing, it instantly filled itself out. So I uh, hope that helps. Um, I wanna take you to a an example of a song I'm working on right now for a client actually, and you can see how um, this works kind of in context of a fuller arrangement. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that the um, there's kind of a gap in one of the frequency uh, ranges, uh, the the mid register, and I'll explain why in a second. But uh, let, let's pop over to that, and you can see what exactly I'm talking about. Okay, so let's take a look at it from the perspective of you know working in an actual piece of music. In this case, I'm working on a song uh, from a client, and you'll notice here, uh, you know, according to the tracks on the side, I basically have uh, a bunch more orchestra going on. Um, so you know. Basically, I have to leave room, even though I'm using all the five sections of the strings. Uh, there has to be stuff for the other parts of the orchestra to do as well. You know, a lot, a lot of the work that I do is string based. You know, I start kind of like from a string bed. I do the counterpoint. I do all that stuff, and then um, afterwards, I'll add other instruments as needed. 
So let me show you the bare bones of what this sounds like with each of the five sections of Cinematic Studio Strings. Now this library does not have the VC, so if you wanted the like violin ones, for example, to play two separate notes, then you would have to use two uh, violin ones patches um, and you know do it that way. But in this case, I just went with a straight you know one one section per track, and this is what that sounds like. So let me just play it here. and then it modulates after that. So what do you notice? I mean, I'm basically using the strings as the foundation for everything. And uh, if you notice, there's there's kind of like some gaps going on here um, in some of the frequencies, especially here in kind of in the mid register where the middle C is. This area, I'm using a lot of other instruments like horns and um, woodwinds to play this, this area. I want the strings to kind of outline the very top. I also want them to support the very bottom with the double basses and then the celli kind of explores that upper territory at times uh you know by going up and going down as well uh one of the points i also want you to notice is that uh, basically each line has its own role you know i'm not just i'm not just playing in parts blindly i actually want each of these sections to be doing something significant so the um the violins one, for example, they're carrying this upper line, and I I like to use them to move by step or even skip sometimes. But basically, they they are uh, moving when the chord is being held, um, and maybe the singers are holding a certain note. Then the violins can actually move and you know do something else to fill in that gap there. A uh, similar story with the violins two. I like to layer them underneath to uh, to have them supporting the violins one but they can have their own bit of counterpoint as well because uh, you know, they're two separate sections, so they can be doing different things. As you can see here, I have violins one and two kind of playing, they're actually playing the same rhythm, but they're playing different notes here. So if you just listen to here. So these ones I have kind of separated by thirds. It's major and minor thirds alternating, it really depends on what, what chord I'm playing. Uh, but here you can see the violins too is kind of doing these extra notes here. Um, just kind of, you have these non chord notes surrounding the chord note in this case. Uh, so it sounds like this. You hear, you hear the da 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 da, right? And this just adds another layer of texture to the overall arrangement. Uh, meanwhile, the the double basses, you know, they're outlining the roots of the chords for the most part because they're all, uh, the chords are in root position. Um, and then you know it has the step up motion while the violas and the celli, uh, they're they're kind of doing um, you know supporting stuff as well. And then because the celli have a richer tone, I like to have them moving a little bit more at times. Like I said, I like to have them going up sometimes uh, to even the viola high register just to really get that intensity going. Um, so. You can see here, I mean, the MIDI is not overly complicated, but the reason I have this bit of this gap here is because, you know, I have these other instruments playing their roles as well. Uh, flute, I have a horn, I have uh, trumpets and stuff going on. So it, it all, uh, and, and here you can see I have a pad of two horns as well. And this kind of fills up that mid middle register like I was talking about. So like the around middle C, a little bit below and a little bit above. Um, you know, orchestration is kind of about, about deciding uh, which instruments are the best at doing whatever, uh, you know, what particular thing you're going for. So in this case, I wanted the horns to lend this, lend a really rich and full sound, while I wanted the um, the the strings to kind of outline the outsides of that area. So the strings are covering the very bottom. They're also covering the very top. There are some mid-range stuff, but in this case, orchestrationally, I wanted a warmer texture in the middle. So I let the horns take, you know, that part. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. And that, that's a kind of a live uh, project situation and how I would arrange the strings around the rest of the orchestra. If I was just doing it um, like a regular string arrangement by itself, then as, as I showed previously, um, you would basically use 
the uh, the middle range or middle register instruments like the um, the celli and the violas and even the violins too sometimes to fill out that middle range just to fill it all up and uh, make it really full and rich. Um, so yeah, it's entirely contextual. I keep on saying that in these videos, but it's it's really true. So uh, I hope that helped. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I will see you in tomorrow's video. Have a great day. Bye bye.